Bonjour, welcome to Wasa Distant Education's radio Zoom classes. This is MBF 3C, grade 11 college math, and I am Robin Slate. If you'd like to participate live today, you can call our Wasa studio at 1-800-465-1744 or 737-4017. You can listen on the radio at 91.9 FM or the television at Bell Express View channel 972. You're always welcome to join me live through the Zoom link, which is available both from me, your teacher, and also your DEC. Classes are scheduled on Monday through Thursday, 11 till 12 in the morning. And we are now in the eighth week of our nine week course. At this point, you definitely should be submitting some work for marking. So a reminder, the support questions, the ones marked with a pencil icon are not for marking, they are just um, practice for you. So you decide which ones and how many to do. If you're understanding the concept, feel free to skip questions. You don't need to spend time on something that isn't beneficial for you. But if you need more practice on something, let me know and I can send you more practice. The answers are in the back of your booklet. So check your work and make sure that you're on the right track. But our mistakes are often found. So if something isn't lining up, check with me and I can let you know if that's actually an error of the book's part. The key questions, the ones marked with the key icon, are the ones to submit for marking. So please do all of them. Show all of your work, your steps and your thinking, so I can give you credit for your understanding. And also that helps me understand what you might be struggling with if you're making errors. There are three different ways to submit your work for marking. So you can scan and send your work in electronically. So scan your completed work in and if you have a smartphone, you can use either the iPhone Notes app or the Android Google Drive app. If you don't have a smartphone and you just wanna take pictures, that's fine as well. Then you can send it either through email or uh, Facebook to me. So the email address to send it to is studentwork at nnec.on.ca and CC it to me bronwyn.slate at nnec.on.ca and then send or send it to me at Facebook at the Slate Wasa. Second method to drop it off in Sioux Lookout, we have an outdoor mailbox at our location 74 Front Street where the big red building next to the post office and there's a small white mailbox next to our side entrance. We still are working remotely so it may take me a couple of days to get your work but I'll get it back to you as soon as I can. Third method is to hand your work into your DEC. Your DEC can either send your work through the express or fax it to 807-737-1732 or toll free fax to 1-800-463-7852. If you have any questions or concerns, please contact me. This is why I'm here. You can email me at bronwyn.slate, which is spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at nnec.on.ca. You can connect with me through Facebook at bslatewasa. You can call and leave a message for me on the main line of the office at 807-737-1488 or toll free 1-800-667-3703. Currently my office hours are Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I'll get back to you as soon as I can. If you'd like to connect with me on social media, both my Facebook and my YouTube are under the name B Slate Wasa. So you can friend me on Facebook and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And then you'll be notified every time I upload one of our radio Zoom classes. There, I post them shortly after airing live. There also are short videos explaining common errors and confusing concepts. So that's a great place to go if you're struggling with something in case there might be an answer there that can help you work through a problem. Math is an incredibly visual subject. So connecting to the videos is really going to set you up for the most success. So either joining me live through the Zoom link or watching the replays on YouTube are really going to make things make the most sense. If you don't have access to reliable, consistent internet, let me know and I can send you the videos on a USB key. All right, we're on day 30 of our course and we are looking at lesson 20 today, which is probability and statistics in the media. This is our last lesson of new material. In our next lesson, we will have a, our final throwback Thursday wrapping up this week. And then next week, we will be reviewing for your final culminating project. So next week in week nine, 
We won't be doing anything new, but we will just be retouching on everything that we've learned so far uh, this term. So our learning goals for today's lesson is that at the end of this lesson, you can say, I will be able to interpret information using probability and statistics in the media, and I will understand the benefits and dangers of probability and statistics in the media. So the success criteria are one, I can think critically about how probability and statistics are used to manipulate information in the media, and I can interpret the meanings of probabilities and statistics to gather information about the world around me. All right, before we dive in, let's activate our brains with a little bit of mental math. So instead of doing mad minutes, we focus on developing strategies that we can apply to various situations where we're really comfortable with the numbers and we're using friendly numbers for ourselves. So that builds our own confidence and our skills opposed to memorization and drilling and killing over facts. Today's question is 172, take away 57. And we're using the strategy of adjusting one number. So there are many ways, probably infinite ways that you could do this. But when I look at this question, I kind of want to have it to say, I want to have a seven in my ones place so that I can take away seven and I don't have to borrow or think about that. So if I think of, instead of subtracting 57 from 172, if I adjust my 172 by adding five to get 177 and I subtract 57 from that. So 177 take away 57 is equal to 120, but I shifted my number up five. So that means I need to shift my number down five in order for this to make sense. And so that's gonna give me to, so if I shift my 120 down five, I'm gonna to get to 150. And that's how you can shift one number to a friendly number in order to do your subtraction. All right, mine's on, let's think about what we need to know. So we just need to remember what probability statistics are and where we might see them. So one of the most common places that we see probability statistics probably almost every day is when we're predicting the weather. I know personally, I'm currently checking the weather fairly frequently to see how much snow here on at the end of March we are still predicting to get. So this is those predictions are made through statistical analysis of past weather and similar similarity to the current conditions. So last year in March, all of our snow was gone, but in previous years, we've still had lots of snow. So using that past, both the times that we didn't have snow, we did have snow, and then looking at the current weather trends, they can predict that if, we're, if it's gonna to continue to snow for the next few days. Another example is in gambling, so specifically say Las Vegas, the odds makers, so people decide how likely a sporting event is going to happen, something in a sporting event is going to happen. And so using, again, past statistics and the current conditions, so who, what sports players, athletes are injured or who are improving, that's going to change the odds of certain things happening. And so that all has this influence on predicting those future outcomes, which is the basis of gambling. So just remembering those sorts of things as we're moving forward in today's lesson. So today's lesson is a little bit different than our previous lessons because we're just analyzing information that we see around us. So instead of me giving you steps of saying, okay, this is how you can understand some probability in the media that you need to do this, step one, step two, step three, step four, that's not realistic. We need to develop critical thinking abilities in order to look at information and analyze it and understand what's going on or what might be missing. So today, really what we're doing is we're just gonna be looking at various statistics and probabilities that come up in the media or come up in our world and talking about them and what we see. So when will you use this in real life? Well, we're learning about how information is communicated. So statistics and probability happen all around us and they might not happen in numbers, they might not happen in graphs, they might happen in different ways that make us not think that it's actually math, but they are all around us and constantly we're getting information communicated based on things. So if you 
go to the doctor and you ask a question, the doctor is going to respond based on research and knowledge that very likely has been gathered through statistical measures and noticing trends that then we can communicate about what might likely happen. Or if you are investing money or trying to decide if something is risky, again, basis on previous trends, on previous patterns, is going to give you that information about what would be the best choice for you. So one thing that comes up a lot when you're searching about statistics and the world around us is this idea of that if we took the whole population of the world and used probability or used statistics in terms of those demographics and narrowed it down to 100 people, what would our world look like? And that can be really interesting and really powerful in terms of being like, wow, this is we're talking about 15 people or out of 100 people or whatever. But what I thought was really Really interesting doing it in the reverse than what is normally done and thinking about how many people that actually is in our world. So we're going to look at some statistics about the world. So we have some data that is saying that if the world were 100 people, this is what language they would speak, this is their age, their religion, their internet access, their nutrition, housing, all sorts of things. We're not going to look at all of them, but we're going to look at a few. And the statistics that I found online in some research are narrowing it down to uh, if the world were 100 people, but I have changed that and gone back to, well, how many people is that actually in our world? So first we're going to look at gender, but so the information that we have here is if the world were 100 people, then 50 would be male and 50 would be female, which maybe is what we would expect. And our current world population is approximately, because it can never be exact, people are constantly being born and dying. So it's constantly changing, but roughly our world population is 7,953,952,577 people. So we are almost at 8 billion people in our world. So when we say that their gender in terms of is 50%, 50 people out of 100 would be male and 50 would be female, that translates to with the actual population to be 3,976,976,288 people are male and the same number are female because we're saying that it's 50-50 in terms of that division of gender or sex. But something that isn't come up in lots of these 100 people representation of the world is that lots of people don't fall within that binary. We don't have really solid statistics because our world is not very accepting of people who don't fall within that binary. And lots of people say that there's only two options. You can only be male or female. It's based on biological sex. It's based on nature. And that's a whole other debate for outside of today's lesson. But roughly, there's some statistics out there that say 0 0.02, so out of two out of the 100 people, would actually fall under the category of non-binary, whether or not trans, non-conforming, gender non-conforming, gender fluid. There's lots of different um, language that lots of different identifiers. And so thinking about, well, people are like, oh, that's, there's like nobody. No, there's a very, very small number. But if we think about that 2%, of our almost 8 billion people, that's 159,079,052 people. That is still a lot of people in our world who don't fit within the, the binary. And this also is a very, very low estimate of the people because many folks either are squishing themselves into a binary because that's the expectation, or are not comfortable disclosing that information because it doesn't feel safe. So these statistics that we have to take with a grain of salt is because we can't, we're putting everything in boxes and everybody doesn't necessarily fit in these really clinical separate boxes. All right, so let's look at more. So another view is to think about how many people and where people live. So we have five out of our hundred, we have five people live in North America. We have nine people. We live 
in South America and Central America. We have 11 people would live in Europe. 15 people would live in Africa and 60 people would live in Asia. This graph doesn't have any information for Australia, New Zealand, and I don't know what this, this area is. Um, but, so that would be my guess with that their population is small in comparison to everywhere else. And so it would be zero, but I'm not sure. That's just my assumption. So again, thinking about, okay, so this tells us that the majority of people are in Asia and next would be Africa and North America where we are is only five out of that hundred people. So we're a very small portion. Our understanding of the world is very, very different than the majority of the people in the world because we're so, there's so, so less of us um, than compared to many folks. Does that translate in terms of the number of people? So in North America, five people is 5%. So 0 0.05 times our 7,953,952,500 577. So that is equal to 397,697,629 people. And then if we continue to look, so 9%, which is in South America and Central America, is 715 million, just over that. I'm not going to read all the numbers. It's just too much. The 11 people in Europe is 874, just over 874 million. And 15 people in Africa, that's 1 billion. 193 million. So over a billion people live in Africa. And then in Asia, that 60% is over 4 billion, almost 5 billion people live in Asia in terms of our global population. And so yes, 60, like, to me, it's meaningful. It says, okay, 60 out of 100 people, that's a lot of people. But then when you translate it, when you calculate it using the probability or the statistic to our full world population, we have almost 5 billion people who live in Asia and have that experience. And that is not what I understand. Like, I don't understand that experience at all being someone who lives in North America. So it's really interesting to reflect upon that. All right, so then now we're going to look at drinking water. So 70, no, sorry, 87 out of 100 people would have safe drinking water. And 13% would have unsafe drinking water. So what does that relate to in the world? Okay, so 87%, so seven, sorry, 6,919,938,740 people have access to clean drinking water, which is great, which is what we want. We want everyone to have access to clean drinking water, but still over a billion people don't have access to clean drinking water. They don't have access to safe drinking water. And I would say that probably in Canada, that is that is true. Part, part of the people who live in Canada are part of that billion people who don't have access to clean, accessible, safe drinking water. Um, that's really, really problematic and really, really heartbreaking that that is true that over a billion people in our world, we can't make it happen that they can have access to safe drinking water. And I don't think that it's that we can't, it's that we don't as a society and as a culture. It's not that it's not possible, it's just that we don't do it, we don't put the funds there, and that's really problematic. So analyzing this information, we're starting to think about what the impacts are on the people around us. So then let's look at food. 15 out of the 100 people would be undernourished. So 15% of our world population is 1,193,092, sorry, 1,193,092,890 people. So almost 1.2 billion people are undernourished, are not getting enough food in our world. That's not okay. How, or why is it that we're not figuring that out? So these numbers are really, really telling about poverty and about the decisions that we as a global population are making. 14 people live with some disability. 
So we think often we think we don't see people with disabilities around us. We think that they that we have one idea of who someone is with a disability, who they are and what they do in their lives. And so, but really 14 people, I've got my wrong number, but I'm really close. So 0.15 is what I have. So this is really close to 14, my bad, is 1,113,553. Sorry, I keep saying the wrong one. 1 billion, 113 million, 553,000. 360. I'm not used to saying words, saying things in the millions and the billions. It just is so much. But 1.1 billion people in our world have some sort of disability. So that is really something that we need to know. We need to acknowledge this is a lot of people in our world that are living with disabilities. And most of media, most of society ignores the existence and the realities of these people. And then we have 48 out of our 100 people would live on less than $2. This is generally two US dollars, which is a little bit different than Canadian dollars, but still close enough. Would live on less than $2 per day. Can you imagine living on less than $2 per day? Really? That's including your rent, your electricity, your heat, or your air conditioning, depending on where you live or whatever, your fuel for your vehicles, your, your vehicle costs, your food costs, your education costs. So 48 people are living on less than $2 per day and 80, 80 people are living on less than $10 a day. So that's still significant. 80 people out of the 100 are living on less than $10 a day. And then even further, one out of two children would live in poverty. So that, those are really big numbers. So if we take that one out of two children, so that is, I looked at, I didn't show us the ages categories for here, but I looked at the percentage of 26 out of 100 people would be children. So one out of two, so one out of, so half of those children would be living in poverty. So that's 13 out of 100 people would be living in poverty, uh, children would be living in poverty. And so that's over 1 billion people in our world are living in poverty. That's not okay. That's just children. Sorry. Over 1 billion children are living in poverty. And that's half of our children in our world are living in poverty. That's not okay. It's a lot of children. So that's just one way of looking and analyzing statistics in our, um, in our world and sort of understanding and thinking about those numbers. And we often sort of make them clinical and sort of detach ourselves from those numbers, but they're really meaningful and can be really powerful. And so being educated about statistics and when you see something that says 60% or says 32% or whatever, one in four, that all means something. That's all representing real people and how many people does that actually mean? Now we're gonna look at a section where we're talking about statistics gone bad. So the other way that statistics can be presented to people is that the headlines or the reports, the graphs can be presented in a way that are misleading. So I'm not saying that they are outright lying in terms of the information that is given, but I'm saying that the way that we interpret that information, if we're not careful, makes us believe one thing opposed to the another thing, which may actually be true. So let's look at those, these examples. So here we have a graph of the rising cost of student loans. And this is in the US based on our source. And it's about 10 years old because that's what I was able to find. That was really clear. So on our left, we have a, this axis, this vertical axis is saying billions of dollars and it's referring to student loan debt. So it's referring to this blue line. And we can see in 2003, it was about uh, 300 billions of dollars. So this is all the debt together. It's not individuals. Not one person has $300 billion of debt, of student debt, but all of it in total. So is increasing, increasing, increasing up to 2012, where it's now almost $900 billion of debt. And then the other axis, other vertical axis is talking about how much in US dollars and the me median, so the middle income for someone who has a bachelor degree. 
So, and we can see that it is wavering as often things do, but started at about, sorry, we have to look over here, started about just over $50,000 a year and then has decreased and now is just over $46,000 a year. So when you're just looking, when you're just glancing at this graph, you says, okay, wow, our student debt is skyrocketing and our uh, median income for someone who has a bachelor's degree is plunging. And there's such big different numbers. Like this is, the student debt is so high and the median income is so low. And that is really, really makes us really assume that people are really not doing well. Now, whether or not that is true, people may or may not be doing well, this graph is really misleading. So they're laid on top of each other, but they don't have any actual real connection. We guess the students potentially are, so in order to get a bachelor income, you need to potentially take a loan, but that isn't guaranteed. We aren't necessarily taught, we're not, we don't have information that says that the median income of people with bachelor's degrees who have taken loans, we don't know if these people are the same people or not. And they aren't, they're pretending that it seems like it's causation. It's like, okay, well this, if you get a loan then you're gonna make low money, like that's what it makes you feel like, but that isn't true. These are just two separate things that are talking about money and talking about the same timeline and talking about education, but there's no actual connection and causation between the two. Also, the total debt, as I said, for the student income is used. And we don't know what the average is for any person. So we're comparing one, which is a total amount, to another, which is talking about individuals. And so we don't really know if it's increased per person or if it's or what's going on. Is it that the more people are going to school and therefore overall that is increased? Our axes are also really different in terms of the numbers that are increasing. So there's lots of little bits in this graph that are making it inconsistent in terms of wondering what's actually going on. Right, so another random statement that has been made is that you are more likely to die on the toilet than by eat, being eaten by a shark. Well, yes, because people spend way more time on the toilet than in the ocean near sharks. So this is not saying that you're going to die while sitting on the toilet, but it is saying that you are more likely to than being by a shark because I personally have been in the ocean, but have never been near a shark in the ocean. So that like the chances of that happening are incredibly rare because most of us don't go in that situation. Whereas most humans go on the toilet every single day. So it just makes it really explanatory. But when you think about it logically, yes, of course that makes sense. All right, another one is the FBI's uniform crime reports show that arrests of juvenile females, so young women, for assaults and violent crime from 1980 through 2003, this is old, but still it's what I found, rose from 20% to more than 30% of the total. So this is saying that, this is implying that young women are becoming more violent, engaged in more assaults and more violent crime by a, quite a large increase. But if you read further about it, what actually, is ha what happened. And so you need more information. You can't just go based on this headline is that it wasn't that the violence increased, but the prosecution of young women increased. So they were more likely to get arrested for doing the same thing in 2003 than they were in 1980. So the actions were still happening at both, and that didn't change. The actual actions didn't change, but the police actions, the, the arrests is what changed. And so, but this doesn't, the statement doesn't make us think about the arrests that makes us think about the violence of these young women. And so it misleads us in that information. Another one is that programs on Animal Planet are fond of citing how Americans spend more money annually on cat or dog food than on baby food. So implying that we, that Americans care more about their animals, their pets than their children. But if you think about it, pets eat, pet food their entire lives. So babies only eat baby food for about a year and a half, maybe. 
And many people have more than one pet at a time, but don't necessarily have more babies than one time. Some people do, but most people don't have babies who are eating baby food at the same time, multiple ones. So for example, in my household, my child, I didn't, I think maybe I bought like one or two little packs when like traveling of like those little squeezy packs of baby food. Um, but my child didn't eat baby food. Uh, they ate processed, like we, they ate, when they started eating solid foods, they ate solid foods. And that was how it worked for them. But I have had two dogs and two cats in my household for significant years for, well, their whole lives. And they, so I have spent significant amount of money on pet food because of that. But does that mean that I care about my pets more than my kid? Definitely not. But that's what the statement is indicating, is sort of implying. So the moral of the story with statistics in the media is that they can be very misleading, both positively and negatively. So I'm not saying that every statistics you shouldn't believe and everything statement that's made in the media is trying to confuse you or trying to make you unaware of really terrible things in the world. They could also be making you think that something's really much better than it is or much worse than it is either way. And it isn't guaranteed that they're trying, there may be, it may be completely factual. They might be giving you all of the information, but you need to ask yourself who's benefiting from this information. So who is benefiting from the being potentially misleading? Is there someone who gains from you thinking one thing instead of another thing? And then asking who is missing? So what stories are not being told from these stories? So that's uh, really important because often we focus really, really narrowly and we are missing many marginalized populations and that's really problematic. And then asking, what else do I need to know? So what else do I need to consider? Like for the pet example, well, I need to know, I need to remember that pets eat pet food their entire lives, whereas babies don't eat baby food their entire lives. That's really gonna be really, really very different. So considering the whole picture is really, really important. So at this point, if you wanna pause the video and on page 16, you can do questions one and two. Again, these for this lesson, it is analysis of information opposed to doing formulas or steps. So it's about thinking about situations and thinking about the, the world around us. So you, it's not like I have an answer key that is gonna be really, really clear in terms of these are the exact right answers. It's about you justifying your answers and thinking about these things and explaining what you're considering. And you might have ideas that I haven't considered because your experience is completely different than mine. And that's really important um, to acknowledge. You just need to explain yourself. This is about explaining your ideas and um, justifying things so that those of us who are reading it or around can understand. All right, so let's consolidate about this lesson. So the lesson 20 highlights for probability and statistics in the media are that statistics can be a powerful way of communicating information. It really can be powerful. I'm a big fan of understanding statistics. I love looking at an infographic and gathering data and gathering information and thinking about the world. They can make things clearer and more accessible to understand, but statistics can also be incredibly misleading. So it's essential to think critically about the information presented to us by the media. We can't just assume that because the media is saying it, because it's on the internet, because it's on the news, it is guaranteed to be the entire story. It probably is part of the story, but we are not, more, more often than not, I would think that it's probably not the whole story. It's not looking, taking everything into account and taking into consideration everybody's experience. And so it's really important to think critically when you're consuming media. And even when it's numbers, we often put a lot of faith in numbers of being really clinical and really exact and not being manipulated. It's either right or it's wrong. And that's not actually true. We can interpret things in different ways or we can present information that is only part of the information and it can still be true, but it isn't the whole truth. And so it's important that we are aware of that and we are conscious of that when we are consuming media. 
so hopefully at this point with your success criteria, you can say, I can think critically about how probability and statistics are used to manipulate information in the media. And you can interpret the meanings of probabilities and statistics to gather information about the world around me so that you're feeling comfortable thinking about it. You might not be able to figure out the whole situation, but if you're comfortable questioning and wanting to ask more questions and wanting to gather more information, then you are on a great road to being confident about your understanding of the world around you. So the practice questions, instead of having like, usually we have do this actual computation or this use this formula, we're gonna continue looking at more statistics that I have found um, around us in some sort of hopefully current events that are sort of uh, relevant to the lives around us. So one that I found that is, I, I found them interesting, hopefully you do as well. So digitally around the world, um, how has the social media and technology been used. So this is from January 2020. So it is before the COVID pandemic for the majority of the world and before um, shutdowns. And it, so we have a total population of approximately 7.75 billion. This is 2020. So it's a little bit less than what the numbers that we were using. Um, but 5.19 billion people at that time were unique mobile phone users. So 5.19 billion people had their own cell phone. I think that we often think that because some places in the world, some poor places or underdeveloped places or less economically developed places, we think that aren't the same technology savvy as we are, which is totally a problematic thing to assume. Um, it's most likely racist and uh, white supremacist focus, like it's centralizing in terms of the westernized European centric focus, but 5.19 billion people, that means a lot of people all over the world are using cell phones. 4.54 billion are using the internet. So less people are using the internet than the, than phones, than uh, cell phones, but that's still over 50% of the world are using the internet. And then 3.8 billion people are active social media users. So about 50% of the world are active social media users, which is interesting to just consider as well. So then looking at media consumption in the age of COVID-19. So looking at since the pandemic has made us had to quarantine and stay home for many folks, there's been a incredibly increase of media consumption um, because many of us are at home and having to use technology and have to use tech media to communicate for entertainment, for work, for social connection, for supports. And so this has strongly increased in these past two years, our consumption of media. So for these um, stats that I'm about to show you, here, this global wind index is just telling us who it is that we're actually talking about. So they surveyed almost 4,000 internet users between the ages of 16 and 64 across the US and the UK to find out how the COVID-19 outbreaks has changed their media consumption. So this is only a reflection of people in the US and the UK. We can sort of speculate that there might be something similar trends in Canada or in other places that are very similar to the US and UK, but, um, there, it's hard to know whether or not these are going to be, this is global. This, we can't say that this is a true for everyone because it's a very small sample of a very particular group of people. But let's look at what we found. So I find these graphics to be quite fascinating the way that they have uh, set them up, which is also really cool in terms of when you're looking at statistics is that we could just have a list of numbers, but the graphics having it um, really it makes it more powerful. So we're looking at the Gen Z age group, which is eight to 23 years old is the Gen Z age group. But remember they said that they just, they just surveyed people 16 to 64. So really this is most likely going to be from 16 to 23 years old. And you can see how this is set up is that each of these, these areas, 
we have around this person's brain. So we have broadcast TV, physical press, radio, online press, musical streaming, none of these, online TV streaming, live streams, books and literature, podcasts, online videos, and video games are all the ways that we're measuring the media. And we can see that the places, so the closer we are to the center of the brain of the head is gonna be closer to zero. And the closer we are to the type of media consumed is gonna be higher and higher value. And we're talking about increased. So this, our values don't go up to 100 because it's, it's about how much we're increasing. So maybe we're increased 100%, but not likely. So from this graph we can see, or this image, we can see that online videos increased 51% so of users of the Gen Z. So online videos like increased so much, whereas physical press only increased 9%. So when people are home, people are, are quarantined in this generation in the Gen Z age group, people were consuming online videos opposed to getting morning newspapers or more magazines or things like that. And 10% didn't increase at all. So only 10% out of this age group didn't have any sort of increase in any sort of media, whereas 90% increased in some way on some point of this image. So then looking at millennials, which are the age group of 29 to 39 year olds. And so the same measurements around this brain. So we can see, we can look and we say, okay, well, there's a, a lot more increase. 10% still had none, but people increased in more ways. So it wasn't like you had to just pick one. You could say that you could increase to multiple ways. And none thing was as strong as 51%, but most of them are 20% to 40%, 45% of that range shows that that was the increase. So millennials have started consuming or are consuming more content in most of the um, areas, particularly in online, online videos, online press and online TV streaming are the areas that are the highest areas of increase. And so being online is the way that millennials have increased their media consumption the most. Gen Z, X, sorry, Gen X, which is 40 to 54 year olds, you can see that their consumption was a lot less than millennials. And you, if you look closely, these dots show your previous years. So Gen Z, millennials, and Gen X, they have here, so you can sort of see it in comparison. But online press is where a lot of um, Gen X has increased, but also broadcast TV. So this is like cable TV um, subscriptions and things like that is where a lot of the Gen X has increased in terms of their consumption of media. And physical press, only 7%. It's increased. It's hard to know if that means that they already have a strong usage of that or not. That isn't telling us. We're not telling us the total amounts. We don't know if, if people of Gen X are already reading physical press and only 7% increased. So again, that's something that we need to be questioning. We're talking about increased, not just about total amount. And then finally, Boomer, which is the 55 to 75 year old age category. And we can see that their media consumption did not increase a lot. So broadcast TV, there's a spike there. And so 42% increased the broadcast TV, which makes sense in terms of that is the technology that was introduced and they grew up with when in their time frame, that's as they were youth, what was new and what they're probably most comfortable with. Whereas online and streaming are all not are, came much later in their lifetimes and they might not be more comfortable. That is an assumption that I'm completely making, but could be true. And none of these is 24%. So 24% of people in this age category did not increase their media consumption, which is dramatically different than all of the other age categories. So that's really interesting in terms of the information that people are getting and where they're getting their information and what they're comfortable with in terms of technology. Um, is just, this is just really telling in terms of the past two years of being in a pandemic and having this sort of really um, narrow focus on something. So then overall looking at this, so this is the teen internet activities as a percent. So this just lists, has a whole list of 
what people were looking for or what people were doing on media or on the internet and then the percentages. So the first column is all of the people, but then we have Gen Z, millennials, Gen X, and boomers. So again, going from the youngest group, Gen Z, up to the oldest group, which is boomers. And so for this first category, which is, we're not gonna go through all of them, but this first one, searching for coronavirus or COVID-19 updates, 71% of increase of millennials were doing that. So millennials were the ones who were searching the most, whereas boomers, 54% were searching the least on the internet. So they're getting their information or not from somewhere else. And it just decreases in terms of what other people are doing. So searching cooking recipes is on here. Again, millennials, 35% increase. Um, Gen Z and boomers, 21% increase. So not a lot of increase. Um, reading about finance, watching movies is also is very high. Listening to music is very, very high for all categories. Um, watching funny videos specifically is also fairly high increase for everybody. Everybody was doing that. Gen Z, 52%, they're the ones who increase the most in terms of watching funny videos. Looking at memes, 54%, also Gen Z, big increase. Boomers, 9% increase. Boomers were not looking at memes. In the pandemic, Gen Z were. That makes sense in terms of what you maybe know about the people around you. So this is just really interesting statistics to look to like analyze the what's going on for the people around us. All right, so then one last um, group of statistics that we're gonna look for this past week has been the Oscars in the US in terms of measuring and celebrating the big movies of the US. Um, and so I got a report from 2021. So the 2022 one wouldn't be released yet. It just happened this week that talks about the demographics of people who won um, awards in the Oscars and how this is from the uh, representation project. So trying to highlight how the majority of people who win Oscars and who are revered as the best filmmakers and best actors and artists in the movie industry are generally straight, white, able-bodied, thin men. So this is looking at people who are not being represented. And I think that that's also really interesting in our media. So quickly going through some of these, some key findings in the 2021 report. So it'd be interesting to look at this year's report when it was released. So only one in four of the best picture winners revolve around the life of a woman lead or a co-lead. Only 8.9% of Best Picture winners feature stories about the lives of people of color. Less than 10% of the best movies that the Academy says that are the best movies are about non-white people. That means over 90% are about white stories. That is incredible how, like, prob that's so problematic. In nearly a century of Academy Awards, only one film has ever featured an LGBTQ plus lead, which is Moonlight, which is also, I believe, uh, person of color. Only 4.8% of the winning films feature a lead with a disability, which would be interesting to think about in terms of this one about disability, the people who are portraying the disability and writing with the disability, how many of them are written or portrayed or acted by people with disabilities. So 4.8%, only 5% of winning features films are talking about the disability, but who's actually talking about that? Is it actually people who have disabilities or is it the non-disabled community talking about disabled community? There are no feature films on Asian, Black, South Asian, Native American or Pacific Islander, MENA, lesbian or large women lead, co-lead has ever won an Academy Award for Best Picture. So these experiences are completely erased. And only one Best Picture film, Driving Miss Daisy in 1990, has ever centered the story of a female character over 50. So we're talking about young women when we are talking about women. So then we also have some more specifics um, in terms of marginalized populations. So, and how it relates to the population in the US. Again, this is US centric because the Academy Awards are based in the US and primary um, the the movies are generally 
there's a few international things, but uh, foreign films, but mostly it's about movies created in the in the US. So women leads, as we said, 25.8%, so one out of four of are in best pictures, and there are over 50%, 0.8% of women in the US. So completely underrepresented. BIPOC, so Black, Indigenous, people of color leads or co-leads. There are 8.9%, as we said, but there are 39.9% BIPOC people in the US. So again, even more underrepresented. The race and ethnicity of co-leads, so this breaks down in terms of that Asian is 1.6%, but the population is 5.9%. Black is 4%, but the population is 13.4%. Latinx is 1.6%. But the population is 18.5%. So that is such a small representation. M E N A, I don't know what that means. I'm going to have to look that up, which is 0% of the films, but is 2.5% of the population. Native American or Pacific Islander, 0% of the films, but is 0.2% of the population. South Asian is 1.6% of the films, but 0.1% of the population. So that's interesting that there's more of the films than represented than the actual population. But white is 91.9% of the films are about white people. And that is only 60% of the population of the US are white. So, so many of the films are talking about one type of story. Also in terms of sexuality, so LGBTQ plus leads are 0.8%, but by statistics only that's 4.5% of the population. And so underrepresented. And the leads and co-leads with disabilities, 4.8% are people who uh, about disabilities, but in the US, 26% disabilities. Again, we don't know who are writing or portraying these stories. So that's even that 4.8% might not actually represent the authenticity of those stories. Then we have um, things specifically on women by race, which is really interesting to see that again, our films are even less, most of the time it's zero. So we are not talking about, when we're talking about anybody with race, we're generally talking about men, but race, we're not talking about women. And these, these statistics don't even include non-binary binary or trans folks. So we're not even talking about that. We're not talking about them. Here, this, I mean, maybe a little bit here in terms of LGBTQ plus women leads, but there's none, um, everybody, all of our women are straight basically. Um, and cisgendered, but grouping sexuality and gender identity together is also problematic. It's not the full story. Some women disability, 6.3% um, of our stories about dis um, women are about women with disabilities and 3.1% of, of our stories are about older women um, that are being shared, mostly about young women. And then finally, body size of women. So 0% of our uh, women that we're talking about are fat women. They are thin women, which is not a representation of what our world is like at all. So that was just sort of, again, looking at some statistics and some of the way that we, that information is communicated in our world to just sort of develop our critical thinking. We are now done our new material for our course. So you should be working on your, uh, Key questions to submit and handing them in. We still have a week left of broadcasts, so there will be review um, tomorrow, Throwback Thursday, and then next week is a review. So always, if you have any questions or concerns, please contact me as always, um, calling and leaving a message for me at the office at 807-737-1488 or 1-800-667-3703. Connecting with me through uh, email is a very effective method, which is bronwyn.slate, spelled B-R-O-N-W-Y-N dot S-L-A-T-E at N-N-E-C dot O-N dot A. Connecting with me on Facebook at B Slate Wassa or going to the replays and watching them on YouTube at also at B Slate Wassa. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, congratulations on finishing all of the 20 lessons and hopefully connecting with me soon so that you can Get those back and get some more feedback and then connecting about the culminating which is the final part of this course for this credit i hope you have a lovely day and miigwech